Um, all right, we're going to talk a little bit about offerings today, and then we're going to look into the ordination of the priest to get things started. Um, and then we're going to look at how quickly a couple of the priests uh, drop the ball. So we go on quite a, a journey today um, through seven, uh, chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10. So I'm going to kind of hustle as fast as I can, but to hit the high points. So let's jump to 7 verse 1 in Leviticus. Um, but before to go too far, keep in mind all of the law, all of the sacrifices, all of the tabernacle instructions are intended to create an environment where the people of Israel can have communion with God. And it is not just about arbitrary rules for rules sake. It is about purification of recognizing the holiness of God, the sinfulness of humanity, but God still wanting to have relationship and communion with his people. And today I was listening to somebody talk about prayer and, you know, prayer is something that the tabernacle, like there were, there were many prayers being offered in the tabernacle all the time. Um, but even in modern prayer, something that we need to remember all the way through scripture, it's prayer is not just about communication. It's about communion with the Lord. And so the tabernacle was this space of prayer and the temple later will be called a house of prayer. All of these things are crucial to understanding what is going on in these spaces. But prayer is not just about communicating to God or even getting communication from God as much as it is being in communion with the Lord. So all of the stuff that we've been going over with the different sacrifices in the ordination of the priest today, all of that is about right communion with God. So let's jump to seven verse one. These are the regulations for the guilt offering, which is most holy. The guilt offering is to be slaughtered in the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered, and its blood is to be splashed against the sides of the altar. All its fat shall be offered, the fat tail and the fat that covers the internal organs, both kidneys with the fat on them near, the loins and the long lobe of the liver, which is to be removed with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering presented to the Lord. It is a guilt offering, any male and a priest's family may eat it, but it must be eaten in the sanctuary area. It is most holy. The same law applies to both the sin offering and the guilt offering. They belong to the priest who makes the atonement with them. The priest who offers a burnt offering for anyone may keep its hide for himself. Every grain offering baked in an oven or cooked in a pan or on a griddle belongs to the priest who offers it. And every grain offering, whether mixed with olive oil or dry, belongs equally to all the sons of Aaron. So as we are uh, rem remembering like the different levels of these different offerings, there are some that are only burned, uh, offered and entirely burned on the altar. There are some that are the, where the priests are allowed to eat the food. Um, in, in the case of the guilt offering, all of that food needs to be consumed in the sanctuary. Um, it is not supposed to be something that they take home. Um, but this is part of the, this, the way that the priests are able to uh, eat, able to provide um, like the hide from the animal, like they to create leather goods and that kind of stuff here, they're able to keep it, take it home. Um, but the food and the guilt offering um, and the sin offering, they only are to be eaten in the tabernacle. And so as we uh, have seen throughout so far, the blood is, uh, the, the life is in the blood. And so as they are sprinkling the blood on all of these different uh, areas uh, in the tabernacle, it is about um, purification. It's about sanctification. Um, and so they are purifying the different elements where the offerings are being uh, placed. And so we've talked quite a bit about blood and the fat and all of these different elements. Um, the fat was the best part of the animal and it was off in the sin offering all the fat is to be offered to the lord um and even um yeah so there here we don't have the specific regulations on like what is supposed to be taken out of the camp and burned outside of the camp but there are we've already seen those kinds of instructions and so those would probably still be in place 
um, even though it's not specifically mentioned here in this offering. Um, Very quick so, question, real quick. Yeah. Uh, at what point in their 40 year journey in the wilderness is this? Uh, this is probably within the first year. So they did this the whole time they were out there? They were supposed to do this the whole time they were out there, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, how, how well they carried this out, uh, we don't totally know. But Moses was there, Aaron and his sons were, were there. But they, um, yeah, it was supposed to be from the moment they ordained the priest, which we'll read about in just a moment, all the way forever is really uh, how it was supposed to be. So not just in the wilderness, when they get into the land, they're supposed to continue these traditions mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah, which is a lot of animals. It's a lot yeah. <laughs> of animals from the flock. So, um, yeah. Uh, and part of the reason why there are these animals is because they're, the sacrifice is intended to, you're, it's not a sacrifice if you don't feel it if you don't recognize the cost of it. And so that's one of the reasons why these animals without blemish are offered is because it's like, yeah, this is a really valuable thing, a really valuable animal. Um, and you are offering it to the Lord as a substitute for you. Um, and, you know, especially with a guilt offering, like, Lord, forgive me, make it right, cover over my sin. I recognize the, the grievous nature of my sin. Um, and so they're offering it to the Lord in that way. So uh, the next offering listed is the fellowship offering in verse 11. Uh, these are the regulations for the fellowship offering anyone may present to the Lord. So this is not just the priests who are offering the fellowship offering. Um, the Israelites can come into the tabernacle and offer these um, on their own behalf. And the priest is like a, is a facilitator essentially. If they offer it as an expression of thankfulness, then along with the thank offering, they are to offer thick loaves made without yeast and with olive oil mixed in, thin loaves made without yeast and brushed with oil, and thick loaves of finest flour, well kneaded and with oil mixed in. Along with their fellowship offering of thanksgiving, they are to present an offering with thick loaves of bread made with yeast. They are to bring one of each kind as an offering, a contribution to the Lord. It belongs to the priest who splashes the blood of the fellowship offering against the altar, the meat of their fellowship offering of Thanksgiving must be eaten on the day it is offered. They must leave none until morning. If, however, their offering is the result of a vow or is a free will offering, the sacrifice shall be eaten on the day they offer it, but anything left over may be eaten on the next day. Any meat on the sacrifice of the sacrifice left over till the third day must be burned up. If any meat of the fellowship offering is eaten on the third day, the one who offered it will not be accepted. It will not be reckoned to their credit, for it has become impure. The person who eats any of it will be held responsible. Meat that touches anything ceremonially unclean must not be eaten. It must be burned up. As for other meat, anyone ceremonially clean may eat it. But if anyone who is unclean eats any meat of the fellowship offering belonging to the Lord, they must be cut off from their people. Anyone who touches something unclean, whether human uncleanness or an unclean animal, or an unclean creature that moves along the ground and then eats any of the meat of the fellowship offering belonging to the Lord must be cut off from their people. So these are some pretty, uh, a wide range of reasons people give these, um, these fellowship offerings. There's three specific things. One is a praise offering. They're expressing their, their gratitude to the Lord. Another is a vow. So they're making a, an offering as a, uh, at the fulfillment of their vow. And there's a passage in the book of Acts where Paul goes uh, and shaves his head as a, um, as a fulfillment of a vow. Uh, and so that could have been like Paul was declaring like he would not cut his hair uh, for a certain amount of time as a way of reminding himself of, of focusing on the Lord. Like, so they make all kinds of vows throughout the Bible. Um, so at the fulfillment of the vow, they would offer the sacrifice in a way of saying, Lord, help, thank you for providing. Thank you for uh, helping me fulfill this promise. Uh, and then a free will offering, which is just saying, God, you are good. And I'm just grateful for your goodness. Um, and so these different kinds of offerings, the, the fellowship offering is fundamentally about worship, 
But again, it is that communion with the Lord and the priests are there as well. And so there's an animal that they bring in and they do all the blood splashing and stuff, but they're also supposed to bring in the bread uh, in this fellowship offering. Um, and that fellowship offering, as we see, is uh, belonging to the priest who splashes the blood of the fellowship offering against the altar, right? So that's part of the, the provision for the priests. Um, but all of the food that is brought in for that fellowship offering and not burned on the altar, the portion that remains needs to be eaten that day. Um, and so that's with the, uh, that is with the uh, thank offering or the, um, the praise offering. The next one is the vow um, or the free will offering. Those can be eaten up to three days later. Um, but at the third day, anything left over must be burned completely. And it's interesting to think through, like the people in ancient times, they didn't have a germ theory like we have now. And so like uh, if food that is, you know, not consumed within three days with no refrigeration and no salting, like it's not going to be good anymore. It's going to turn. And so even here, the Lord is giving them these kinds of instructions about purity. Um, but there's a, a health component as well where, you know, yeah, we don't know what germ theory is, but if you eat that, you're going to be sick. Um, and so the, the Lord is saying like, don't eat things that have been out too long, which I think is an interesting little note to see, like the Lord pays attention to those kinds of details. Um, and then the challenge though, is anything that like they eat that is impure, like if they touch a, a impure food or the, they consume food that has been contaminated with impurity, the text says they must be cut off from their people. And there is some disagreement on what that means, cut off, whether it is they are to be executed, like cut off or is it a divine curse where the lord is saying like if you do this you will not be able to reproduce your line will of descendants will be cut off uh, or you know is it just uh you will need to be like excluded from the community until you're able to come back into ceremonial cleanliness and purity and so there's some a range of um ex understanding of what cut off means, but there are violations that are clearly tied to cut being cut off that are supposed to tie in with uh, execution. And so that's part of where people are like, this is really serious business. So things like um, violating the Sabbath uh, is one of those things that where you are cut, cut off and potentially executed, any kind of divination, witchcraft, uh, uh, sexual morality is something where people are told to be they are cut off um and so like this is a serious message to the lord or from the lord to the people essentially saying like take worship seriously you're worshiping the lord in the tabernacle take it seriously as seriously as as murder as seriously as sexual morality like worship the lord with purity in mind um and so let's let's keep going verse 22 uh the lord said to moses Say to the Israelites, do not eat any of the fat of cattle, sheep, or goats. The fat of an animal found dead or torn by wild animals may be used for any other purpose, but you must not eat it. Anyone who eats the fat of an animal from which a food offering may be presented to the Lord must be cut off from their people. And whoever, wherever you live, you must not eat the blood of any bird or animal. Anyone who eats blood must be cut off from their people. And so the blood and the, the fat of these animals, these are... in are offered to the Lord, it is not something that the people are supposed to consume. And one of the ways that we should understand, like the ancient traditions and ancient um, peoples, like they would sometimes drink the, the blood of animals in a way to uh, take on the power of the animal. That was part of their, their worship uh, and their, their idol idolatrous practices. Um, but also like that, they wouldn't just drink blood. They they would also uh, occasionally work it into the bread so that they would be consuming the life of the animal, the blood life force um, in a way where it was more palatable, um, but it was still trying to take on the power of, of a bull, right? Um, 
And the Lord is saying, don't do that at all. Like all of that, like the life of the animal, like honor the life of the animal, like recognize that they are taking your place. You're not trying to take something from them. Um, and also like the fat, like that is for the Lord and not for you. And if you eat these things, you are cut off, which is intense. But there's an interesting little side note in here. If you find an animal uh, that is dead or torn by wild animals, you can use it for any other purpose, but you can't eat it. And so like, what would you use the fat for from an animal that you found? Well, like making candles and stuff. Uh, candles are um, made, candles, soap, those things have a an animal fat base. Um, and so like, if you find an animal that way, you can repurpose the fat, but um, never eat it, never drink it for the people of Israel. So, which is intense, like, and to be cut off again, like cut off, take worship of the Lord. Seriously, remember the blood of the animal, the, the fat of the animal, those are for the Lord. Um, so let's go, keep going. Verse 28, the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, anyone who brings a fellowship offering to the Lord is to bring part of it as their sacrifice to the Lord with their own hands, they are to present the food offering to the Lord. They are to bring the fat together with the breast and wave the breast before the Lord as a wave offering. The priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast belongs to Aaron and his sons. You are to give the right thigh of your fellowship offerings to the priest as a contribution. The son of Aaron who offers the blood and the fat of the fellowship offering shall have the right thigh as his share from the fellowship offering of the Israelites. I have taken the breast that is waved and the thigh that is presented and have given them to Aaron, the priest and his sons and their perpetual share from the Israelites. This is the portion of the food offering presented to the Lord that they are allotted to Aaron and his sons on the day they were presented to serve the Lord as priests on the day they were anointed. The Lord commanded that the Israelites give this to them as their perpetual share for the generations to come. Then uh, these then are the regulations for the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the ordination of offering, the ordination offering and the fellowship offering, which the Lord gave Moses at Mount Sinai in the desert on, of Sinai on the day he commanded the Israelites to bring their offerings to the Lord. And so here are the basically the, the summation of all of the offerings and the sacrifices coming into this point, leaving with like, what is the, the priest share from these offerings? And so they have the right thigh and a part of the, the breast of the animal and uh, they are supposed to like wave it to the Lord, which is essentially like hold it up and uh, say, Lord, this is your gift to the priests uh, recognizing that he is apportioning it for them. And again, the priest did not uh, have uh, flocks. They did not have land that they were going to inherit in, in the land, the promised land. Um, so they did not have a way to generate food and those kinds of things for themselves. And so they were dependent upon the, the people of Israel. So the whole tribe of Levi, um, this was the system to support them because they were going to be scattered throughout the different tribes of, of Israel. So um, yeah, so these things are for the priests. And so it's something that is supposed to help sustain the priests. Um, and, uh, and again, this is something that should be going on for perpetuity for the people of Israel, especially when they get into the land to remember the priests. And as you see in, in the book of Judges, we meet a, a Levite who is not honoring the Lord and he jumps in to work with a, a man and serve as for his household gods. And so the priests weren't always the most righteous people in when they get into the land. And so these laws and these these codes are things that the the people and the priests did not always do a good job with, um, and so that's part of the challenge that the people of Israel had throughout their history um, was not taking worship of the Lord seriously, which led to exile, which led to discipline, um, and so when they come back, they are more intently following Jesus or not Jesus. They're more intently following the Lord. Um, through, and so that's where we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees trying to help people like be righteous, um, take the Lord's law seriously, but it took a long time. So they give all these commands. Moses is giving these command, get, receiving these commands from the Lord and he's giving them to the people. And then right away, they just start doing things. And so, um, 
the next section here, Leviticus 8 through 10, uh, has uh, several different sections that are walking through the actual ordination of the priests and leading to um, helping the people see the priests transition. Uh, like So Moses so far has been leading the people as a priest, but now he's going to hand it over to Aaron and his sons. Uh, and so that's what this next section of Leviticus is really doing um, in, the, in the narrative arc of the book is this transition from Moses to Aaron and his sons. So chapter eight. The Lord said to Moses, bring Aaron and his sons, their, their garments, the anointing oil, the bull for the sin offering, the two rams and the basket containing bread made without yeast and gather the entire assembly at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Moses did as the Lord commanded him and the assembly gathered at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Moses said to the assembly, this is what the Lord has commanded to be done. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons forward and washed them with water. He put the tunic on Aaron. He tied the sash around him, clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him. He also fastened the ephod with the decorative waistband, which he tied around him. He placed the breastpiece on him and the urim and the thummim in the breastpiece. He, then he placed the turban on Aaron's head and set the gold plate, uh, the sacred emblem on the front of it as the Lord commanded Moses. And so he is creating the, uh, or the people were instructed to bring all these elements for the clothing in Exodus. And we talked about that when we were going through all of that. And so now he's actually putting these clothes on Aaron. And this is the, these clothes, the high priestly robes were intended to help him stand out and to help people see he is the chief worship leader for the people of Israel. And so this ordinary ordination ceremony is about setting Aaron and his sons apart. Um, and there is a, um, yeah, this transfer of authority, transfer of leadership that is going on. And so ordination, even today, when we do an ordination service in our denomination, there is a laying on of hands. We have, um, just a second, I'm going to get something real quick. I have props. Uh, when I was ordained, okay. When I was ordained, uh, they put this sash on me in the service. And then they also gave me a shepherd's crook and a Bible. And these are our, pro, uh, our traditions uh, method of signifying ordination, that you have a, a level of authority in the denomination uh, where you can like lead churches, lead different ministries. You know, it's, it's not as intense as the ordination in the book of Leviticus here, but it's still like symbolically rich, this transferring uh, from one person to another. It's a, a transformative event um, in, uh, in religious cultures around the world, this kind of ordination. And so here Moses is doing all of this to Aaron. Um, and so verse 10, then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and everything in it. And so consecrated them. He sprinkled some of the oil on the altar seven times, anointing the altar and all its utensils and the basin with its stand to consecrate them. He poured some on the, uh, the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Then he brought Aaron's sons forward, put tunics on them, tied sashes around them and fastened caps on them as the Lord commanded Moses. He then presented the bull for the sin offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on his head. Moses slaughtered the bull and took some of the blood and with his finger, he put it on all the horns of the altar to purify the altar. He poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. So he consecrated it to make atonement for it. Moses also took all the fat around the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver and both kidneys and their fat and burned it on the altar. But the bull with the hide and its flesh and its intestines, he burned out, up outside the camp as the Lord commanded Moses. He then presented the ram for the burnt offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head. Then Moses slaughtered the ram and splashed the blood against the sides of the altar. He cut the ram into pieces and burned the head, the, piece, and the pieces and the fat. He washed the internal organs and the legs with water and burned the whole ram on the altar. It was a burnt offering, a pleasing aroma, a food offering presented to the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. And so the, uh, Moses is creating a, uh, a sanctification, a anointing of all of the elements. And so he's starting with the, the, the altar. 
he anoints the the he anoints Aaron with oil. And there's a psalm, Psalm 133, where the Lord uh, which says um, how good and pleasing it is for brothers to live in unity. And it talks about the it's like the oil running down Aaron's beard. And so in this moment uh, here, we see Aaron and Moses uh, working together to bring the people into unity, to lead them as they worship the Lord. And so um, this, uh, this is a very rich moment in the history of the people of Israel. Um, and he, so it even echoes all the way into Psalm 133, which was written hundreds and hundreds of years after these events. People are still talking about this uh, moment. Um, and so this is a, a, a lot of oil that is being poured out. Um, and so setting the people apart, anointing them. And then again, the blood going on the horns of the altar, splashing it on the sides of the altar, taking the, doing all of the instructions that, that Moses was given. He's taking the, the things that need to be burned outside the camp, outside the camp, basically demonstrating to the priests and the people what this offering looks like. Um, and so the, the first ram is completely burned up on the altar there as well. He then, in verse 22, he then present the other ram, the ram for ordination, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on it, said, Moses slaughtered the ram and took some of its blood and put, put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. And that's one of those weird little details, but like from head to foot, like, like, from his his ear like what he hears let it be glorifying the lord what he what he puts his hands to to work let he glorify the lord wherever he goes with his feet let him glorify the lord and so these different elements like from head to toe are consecrated to the lord uh, moses also brought aaron's sons forward and put some of the blood of the lobes on their right ears on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet then he splashed blood against the sides of the altar. After that, he took the fat, the fat tail of the fat around the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver, both kidneys and their fat and the right thigh. And from the basket of bread made without yeast, which was before the Lord, he took one thick loaf, one thick loaf with olive oil mixed in and one thin loaf and put these on the fat portions on the right thigh. He put all these in the hands of Aaron and his sons and they waved them before the Lord as a wave offering. Then Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar on top of the burnt offering as an ordination offering, a pleasing aroma, a food offering presented to the Lord. Moses also took the breast, which was his share of the ordination ram and waved it before the Lord as a wave offering as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood from the altar and sprinkled them on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and on their garments. So he consecrated Aaron and his garments and his sons and their garments. And so Aaron, all of this process is about making the priests sacred, make, preparing them to do the tabernacle work. And so following all of the instructions, Moses is doing this for them, for the people. In the future, the, when the high priest like dies, they will do this all again for the next high priest. Um, and so like, it's important that they have a record of how to do all the steps even though as we're reading it, it's like, didn't we just go over this? Yes. But here Moses is doing this to show the people what to do. Um, yeah. And so he does the anointing of, with the blood on the right ear, right thumb, big toe for Aaron, then for his sons, and then splashes the blood on the altar. And then he sprinkles a mixture of oil and blood on the, uh, the, on Aaron and his sons um, to consecrate them. And, uh, and then there's the different wave offerings. A lot of it is just put on the altar to burn because this is all part of this consecration making holy. Um, so the three essential features of this ordination offering, the anointing of the bodily extremities, the offering of the grain and the thigh and a wave of elevation offering and the sprinkling of Aaron and his sons and their garments with blood distinguish uh, this uh, occasion from other times of Israelite sacrifice, these ceremonies uh, depicted here in the narrative of the commencement of the priestly service became the pattern for ordaining priests in Israel for perpetuity. Verse 31, Moses then said to Aaron and his sons, cook the meat at the entrance to the tent of meeting and eat it there with the bread from the basket of ordination offering. As I was commanded, Aaron and his sons were to eat it 
then burn up the rest of the meat and the bread. Do not leave and the entrance to the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your ordination are completed for your ordination will last seven days. What has been done today was commanded by the Lord to make atonement for you. You must stay at the entrance to the tent of meeting day and night for seven days and do what the Lord requires. So you will not die for that is what I have been commanded. So Aaron and his sons did everything the Lord commanded through Moses. So they're doing all of these things. And one of the key pieces is they have to stay for seven days. And so as they are um, waiting there, what are they doing? They are praying. They are fasting. The, the actual opening of the, the tabernacle is not yet completed until these seven days are completed. And part of this is part of the reason for this is it's a seven days to keep the people, the, the priests separate from anything that could put, possibly contaminate them outside of the tabernacle. So um, any kind of marital relationship. So uh, any kind of death in the family, uh, any dead animal that they might run into. There are different things that bring uh, ceremonial impurity to the people. And so they are to stay there for seven days. Um, and so there's a, a significant amount of prayer and fasting that is happening. And the, the consequence of ignoring that seven day period is death. The Lord is taking this very seriously. And that also gives us a full week and a Sabbath rest to, to walk through this ordination process. And so um, that's part of this as well, is letting the Sabbath happen in that process. Um, so let's look at chapter nine. So the priests are consecrated. They are ordained. Chapter nine, verse one, on the eighth day, Moses summoned Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. He said to Aaron, take a bull calf for your sin offering and a ram for your burnt offering, both without defect and present them before the Lord. Then say to the Israelites, take a male goat for a sin offering, a calf, and a lamb, both a year old and without defect for a burnt offering and an ox and a ram for a fellowship offering to sacrifice before the Lord together with a grain offering mixed with olive oil for today, the Lord will appear to you. And so this is the official start of Israel's public worship on this eighth day after ordination. And um, it is a, a fellowship offering that they are instructed to prepare for the Lord to, to come and join them, to be in communion with them. So everything they've been working for, what they have been desiring to build the tabernacle, to ordain the priest, to uh, uh, assemble the necessary sacrifices, all of this stuff, it's coming to this moment. And so he even still, Aaron and his sons bring the sin offerings um, throughout all of this. And one of the key parts here is we have this calf uh, and commentators look at that, that bull calf and recognize that just a few months earlier, Aaron was offering a false or creating a false idol in the form of a calf. And here the Lord is saying like, bring a real calf and let, let slaughter it as a way of saying there will be no idolatry in the community of the Levites. We are not going to play around with that anymore. Um, and so they did everything as prescribed by the Lord. And verse five, they took the things Moses commanded at the front of the tent of meeting and the entire assembly came near and stood before the Lord. Then Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded you to do so that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Moses said to Aaron, come to the altar and sacrifice your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and the people. Sacrifice the offering that is for the people and make atonement for them as the Lord commanded. So Aaron came to the altar and slaughtered the calf uh, as a sin offering for himself. His sons brought the blood to him and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar. The rest of the blood he poured out at the base of the altar. On the altar, he burned the fat, the kidneys, the long lobe of the liver from the sin offering as the Lord commanded Moses. The flesh and the hide he burned up outside the camp. Then he slaughtered the burnt offering. His sons handed him the blood and he splashed it against the sides of the altar. They handed him his burnt offering pieces, piece by piece, including the head, and he burned them on the altar. 
he washed the internal organs and the legs and burned them on top of the burnt offering on the altar. So Moses is, Aaron is doing all of the things. So as we're walking through, there's not a lot of re-explanation that I'm doing right now. I'm just saying he's walking through all of the steps um, as the uh, sin offering for Aaron, his family, and the people of Israel. Um, and so that was for just Aaron's family. Verse 15, Aaron then brought the offering that was for the people. He took the goat of the people's sin offering and slaughtered it and offered it as a sin offering as he did with the first one. Now note for Aaron's family, it's a calf. It's a, it's a bull calf. Like, so a cow is a much more expensive animal than a goat for the people. The sin offering is a goat here. He brought the burnt offering and offered it in a prescribed way. He also brought the grain offering, took a handful of it and burned it on the altar. In addition to the morning's burnt offering, he slaughtered the ox and the ram as the fellowship offering for the people. His sons handed him the blood and he splashed it against the sides of the altar. But the fat portions of the ox and the ram, the fat tail, the layer of the fat and the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver, these they laid on the breasts. And then Aaron burned the fat on the altar. Aaron weighed the breasts at the right thigh before the Lord as a wave offering, as Moses commanded. Then Moses, Aaron lifted his hands toward the people and blessed them. And having sacrificed the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the fellowship offering, he stepped down. Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. The fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. So Aaron is doing all of the things and he blesses the people. And we um, may have this blessing uh, later on in the book of Numbers. We are given the high priestly blessing, which is what how we conclude our services every Sunday. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord smile upon you and give you peace. Um, and... Uh, so he may have done that blessing here um, in one of these two or both. Um, and so when he first does it, he steps off the altar and then comes, goes into the tent of meeting with Moses. And when they come out, bless him again. And all the, the people all see God's glory. And in earlier, only Moses saw the glory of God on Sinai. That was the last time we see the people. God's glory revealed. Um, and so now in this moment, all of God's glory, his kavod, his weightiness appears before the people and fire comes from the tent. That would have been a pretty amazing event. Um, and in the fire then goes directly to the altar and consumes everything completely on the altar. And so this is a um, a, a significant moment for the people to recognize that, that God is real and God is powerful. Fast forward into the, um, the time of the Kings and Elijah, the prophet is thrown down with the prophets of Baal. And in that moment, he built an altar and puts a calf on the prophets of Baal. They put their animal their, their, their bull on their altar and nothing happens because Baal doesn't have the power and authority. Uh, and so then Elijah does his, he cuts it up, prepares it all, puts it on the altar, drenches the whole offering so much that like the trench around the altar gets filled up. Like this is a very soaked animal here. Um, and then he just says, Lord, reveal yourself. And the glory of God comes in fire and consumes the whole altar, the whole everything. Like this is that kind of a moment in the, like where it consumed all the animal off the altar. Like, so we are seeing again, the authority of the Lord on display. Like that's what this was for. And so the people respond by worshiping God. They fall face down um, in worship before God because of the weightiness of the Lord. And um, this would have been a pretty exciting day. And as we move on to the last section, this excitement may have uh, stirred up some passion and revelry. And that could explain what happens to Nadab and Abihu. And so let's go to chapter 10. Aaron's son, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers. And a censer is a, a thing where you would burn incense in it. 
took their censers, put fire in them and added incense. And they offered the unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out of the presence, came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy in the sight of all the people. I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. Moses summoned Mish Mishael and Elzaphan, sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, come here, carry your cousins outside the camp away from the front of the sanctuary. So they came and carried them still in their tunics outside the camp, as Moses ordered. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, do not let your hair become unkempt. Do not tear your clothes or you will die. And the Lord will be angry with the whole community. But your relatives, all the Israelites, may mourn for those the Lord has destroyed by fire. Do not leave the entrance to the tent of meeting or you will die because the Lord's anointing oil is on you. So they did as Moses said. Then the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons are not to drink wine or other fermented drink whenever you go into the tent of meeting or you will die. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come so that you can distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. And so you can teach the Israelites all the decrees the Lord has given them through Moses. And so what is this unauthorized fire? Nadab and Abihu, in the excitement of the moment, they take their own censors and they are wanting to help worship the Lord and they think they're doing the right thing. Um, but this was not in any way what God had commanded. And so there may be a clue for what's happening later uh, in the instructions that the Lord gives to Aaron, um, because he's, he tells them at this point, like, don't drink any fermented drink when you're serving in the tabernacle. And so it could be that Aaron, uh, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu were drunk and they were celebrating the worship of the Lord, uh, but they were um, not honoring him uh, and they were a drunk. That could be part of it. Or it could just, it could simply just be, they were not doing what God had commanded them. And so then the Lord gave that instruction about not drinking uh, anything while serving in the tabernacle so that they would never be confused again. Because if the specific things here, he says, so that you can distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean things. And so it's not that the priests could never have wine, it's when they are serving in the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, they need to be sober and right-minded. And so that's this instruction here. And so this could be a message of grace to Aaron and his family to say, hey, don't ever, ever get these things confused. And to help you not get confused, don't drink and serve in the tabernacle. We also see here an interesting point. Uh, Aaron's uncle Uzael, um, like his sons, Mishael and Elsa found, they are brought because all of Aaron's sons are supposed to be working in the tabernacle. They're not allowed to touch any unclean thing, which like a dead body would make them unclean. And so their cousins come to take Nadab and Abihu out. And the, Moses, like the, how hard must this have been for Aaron and, and the other surviving sons to see um, their family like die because of their, um, rebellion to the Lord's against the Lord's commands. And it's, it's intense. Moses says, don't even grieve right now. You can't grieve. You need to hold on to your purity. You need to hold on to like the ceremonial cleanness. Like, you can't grieve right now. You, you have to go through this whole ordination process, go through the whole, uh, journey. We do not want to defile what God has created here. Um, and for mourning in the ancient Israelites, there was a, a long process of, of like uh, a formal mourning, which would lead to impurity. And so they're not allowed to do that at all. And so this is not to say they could never mourn, but right now they are not allowed, the Aaron and his sons are not allowed to mourn, but the rest of Israel could mourn. And, uh, and so that was, uh, it's a weird story. Nadab and Abihu. It's not the only time the priests are going to have moments of conflict uh, where they have to learn how to do this. 
and sadly more they they learn by disobedience um and so we have just gone through a ton of laws about how to prepare for ordination and how to prepare to worship the lord and on the day that they start they've already messed it up two priests already have done the wrong thing so um yeah verse 12 let's keep going moses said to aaron and his remaining sons eleazar and ithamar take the grain offering left over from the food offering prepared without yeast and presented to the lord and eat it before the altar for it is most holy eat it in the sanctuary area because it is your share and your son's share for the food offerings presented to the lord for so i have been commanded but you and your sons and your daughters may eat the breasts that were waved at the thigh and those presented. Eat them in a ceremonially clean place. They have been given to you and your children as your share of the Israelites' fellowship offerings. The thigh that was presented to the breast of the waved before, must be brought with the fat portions of the food offering to be waved before the Lord as a wave offering. This is the perpetual share for you and your children as the Lord has commanded. When Moses inquired about the goat of the sin offering and found that it had been burned up, he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's remaining sons, and asked, why didn't you eat this sin offering in the sanctuary area? It is most holy. It was given to you to take away the guilt of this community by making atonement for them before the Lord. Since its blood was not taken into the holy place, you should have eaten the goat in the sanctuary area as I commanded. Aaron replied to Moses, today... They sacrificed their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. But such things as this have happened to me. Would the Lord have been pleased if I had eaten the sin offering today? When Moses heard this, he was satisfied. And so here we have Moses and Aaron looking at this, con this, this, this moment of tragedy with different perspectives. Um, Moses is concerned about doing everything perfectly and the disposal of the offering uh, in relation to the manipulation of the blood. Aaron is concerned about uncleanness caused by deaths at the beginning of the chapter. And so they, they, the two confront the issue and come to a resolution. Aaron as the new high priest gives this response and it's a reasonable response. Uh, and Moses as the leader of the community accepts it. The incident shows that practice could change and adjust appropriately to circumstances and current need. It also highlights the significant position of Aaron. Aaron is now fully the high priest and the head of the tabernacle sacrificial system. He gives every, even the mediator Moses, a ruling about the cultic issue, and Moses is satisfied by it. Because Moses, Aaron, like this, the priests are, are offering a sin offering for the priests. They, there were priests who sinned. And so it's like, we can't eat an offering that is now a sin offering because of this thing that happened. So like, I know I'm supposed to eat this, but it's also a doing a double duty. And so I want to make sure that it is the sin offering and that is, is handled appropriately. Uh, so moral of the story, like it's hard to boil it all down into just a simple moral, but the worship of God should never be characterized by carelessness, especially about those who have a spiritual leadership role. And so for like, the church today, like, you know, we don't have the same sacrificial system in place, but, you know, we should take what we do seriously. And it doesn't mean that you, we have to, I don't, like, I don't wear this every week, even though I'm ordained. Um, I don't wear this any week, really. Um, but like to recognize that when we step into the role of serving the Lord's people, that we should be examining our hearts, preparing our hearts as pastors as people in the church, like we should also be examining our hearts and recognizing that, yes, we don't offer the sacrifices the same way, but Jesus, our final sacrifice, has entered into the tabernacle in heaven on our behalf with his own blood and made a way for us to be uh, in communion with the Lord. And so we should take that seriously. And so when worship is something that we get to do um, freely, uh, it, like right now we are free to worship God every day, but when we gather together, we should also be very serious about what we are doing. We are worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth in communion with, with the Holy spirit and with the, the 
brothers and sisters in the church. And this is a time for us to be, to revere God and celebrate his goodness together. So that is Leviticus 7 through 10. Any questions, any thoughts? I know we uh, talked a lot about blood and offerings and we're almost done with offering talk. It's just a few more of those um, when we get into festivals specifically. So yeah, but any, any thoughts or questions? No. I thought it was kind of interesting about the whole not eating blood or fat or anything like that. It's ironic because I was talking to Sydney yesterday about about steaks, and she and I have a different way that we prefer to eat steak. She prefers animal. I prefer breathing, and just the thought of. Uh, what you said it makes me want you know and this is kind of a stupid thought but it just sometimes it just makes me wonder uh like does that mean that they had to have like this this meat cooked thoroughly so that there was no blood or fat or anything on it yeah just- um i'm not a rabbi so i don't know all of the requirements for the kosher meals um but there is a specific way that animals were to be butchered, that would drain the blood out of the animal. Um, and so then also very lean cuts of meat were, were a major part of kosher foods as well. So um, whether or not they had to cook everything to very well done, I, I don't know. I think it's main, I think the main thing is that they are doing the best they okay. can to drain the, the blood out of the animal before they consume it. So for us today, like, I don't think that the Lord looks upon your medium rare steak with like disgust. <laughs> I think, I think there is a, a, a difference um, in like why you would have a medium rare steak as opposed to why consuming blood is not allowed in the worship practices for the people of Israel. Because it was t- in, in the pagan world, it was tied to the either worship of the, the animal or trying to consume the powers of the animal because life is in the blood. And so for like for our our modern world, like that's not really something that people are doing in America. It is something people are doing in other parts of the world. And so we should just be mindful. Like in Kenya, the on the Masamari, the 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 people there, like they drink cow's blood regularly. And, um, and so that's something that we need to recognize, like in context, we, if we're preaching the gospel to people who do drink, consume blood as a part of their worship practice, we have to be able to say like, this is, this is not how the Lord is calling his people to worship. And there are Mm -hmm. things that we need to be willing to turn away from in culture that are tied to wrong or impure ways of worshiping God. So, yeah. But if you just go out to a steak dinner and get a medium, medium rare, I think you're still okay. If you get the blue steak, I don't know how you do that, but um, that's, that's not for me. So, um, yeah. I have a question. Can it, I you know, it takes a lot of skill. It does. <laughs> Sydney. Yeah, I had a, a follow-up kind of question to that, just like based off of like the the way Jay was asking this question of like how does basically what I heard in that is like how do these things apply um, today? And I was just like trying to think about that because I was thinking about like the same idea when it comes to um, like what you're talking about of like being cut off um, and like the intense of those things especially when it's like I mean like not taking a sabbath and then like being cut off or even killed and I'm just thinking like how do we apply those kinds of things or those concepts or those principles today 
Um, cause I'm in there sometimes when I don't take a full Sabbath and I'm like, Ugh. you know what I mean? So it's just like, um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess that, yeah, I think that, that gets at my question. Yeah. Well, uh, that's really good. And one of the things to recognize as we think through what Jesus has accomplished for us, when it talks about, he set aside the law and like, even in Ephesians, we're talking about him completing, setting aside, some translations say abolishing the law. What does that mean? And so as we look through the New Testament, what we see is Jesus is uh, completing the sacrificial law and the ceremonial law. So like the sacrifices for our sins, Jesus finished that. We don't have to make those sacrifices anymore. The ceremonial law about um, like what keeps you from worshiping God, like clean, unclean animals, um, touching a, a, a dead object, even not taking a full complete Sabbath. Jesus has completed that for us. But when we look mm -hmm. at the law about the moral law, we don't see Jesus ever like ever indicating that he's abolishing the moral law. He's actually going beyond the law. So instead of saying like, you should not murder, you should not even be angry with somebody like Jesus actually makes the moral law even more intense because like that is the, what is the indication of the transformed heart is what's, what's coming out of us is whether or not our hearts are truly transformed. And so, um, so for like things like Sabbath breaking and clean, unclean foods, those kinds of things, like Jesus has accomplished that. Uh, he's set those as things aside, even the um, like tattoos, like, you know, I, I don't have any tattoos. I have no real passion for tattoos and I really don't care um, as long as your tattoo is not your, like, I got this tattoo because I wanted to worship Satan. Like that's because um, that's what tattoos were about markings for the dead or for mm -hmm. the uh, for different spirits to be marked by them. And so Jesus like is if, if you have a tattoo that is like your mom's name and just saying like, I just love my mom, or whatever. Like that's not me saying like you worship your mom. And if you do worship your mom, you should not, you should only worship Jesus. Um, but <laughs> like those kinds of things are, are all part of the worship system. And so we have to kind of walk through those. And so when we read the law, we should rec ask like, okay, why is this here? Is it a part of the sacrificial system? Is it about ceremonial cleanness or uncleanness? Or is it about a moral law? Um, and those first two, Jesus has accomplished for us. And the third one is one that we say, okay, how do I live this out? And so like if, mm -hmm. because we don't, um, we don't have those same cultural dynamics, like, you know, there are laws about how to treat slaves in the, in the, in the law, right? That's a moral law. But if you do not have a slave, it is not a command to go get a slave, right? Mm. And so sometimes people take those moral laws and they go farther than they need to. Um, so uh, they, they build a hedge around the law to kind of protect you from possibly breaking the law. So if there mm. is a, uh, my, like my favorite law in all of the Old Testament is when you enter into the land, I don't, I don't remember the reference, but when you enter into the land and you build your houses, put a parapet around the roof of your house so that you, your neighbor does not fall off and thus bringing blood guilt upon yourself, right? That's my mm -hmm. favorite Old Testament law because it is a clear indication of how do we love our neighbor? That's a moral question. How do you love your neighbor? And one of those mm -hmm. ways to love them is to make sure they don't fall off the roof of your house. Now that only makes sense if people hang out on the roof. And that's usually because they had flat roofs. I do not have a flat roof. So it would be foolish of me to build a parapet around my angled roof um, so that I would be fully in com compliance with the law, the moral law, right? But I do have a flat deck. And if my deck doesn't have a rail on it and somebody falls off and they break their neck, that's my fault because I wasn't loving my neighbor adequately by not having a rail for them. Does that make sense? 
mm-hmm. I feel like I'm, 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 I'm rabbit trailing a little bit. Um, no, no, no. That, that was like really, really helpful. That definitely answer, answered my question. Do you have any resources on like that topic of like sacrificial ceremonial and like moral law that you can think of off the top of your head? Off of the top of my head, I don't. <laughs> okay. But, um, I can look into into that. Um, yeah. The law for Christians. Thank you. All right. So, any other any other questions? This, uh, uh, it's not a question so much as a real quick comment. Maybe you have a comment back. So, in the Book of Acts, when they had the big debate about what did the Gentiles, how much of Judaism did the Gentiles have to follow in order to be okay as Christians? And they decided um, Gentiles do not need to be circumcised, but avoid foods that have been strangled and that still have the blood in them. I think that's curious because at least here in America, as to my limited knowledge, but to my knowledge, uh, Gentiles continue being circumcised. And as Jay was saying, we don't really care how the dead meat got into the grocery store. And, you yeah. know, I'm certainly guilty of eating a rare steak. In fact, in Canada, they eat something called blood pudding, which is literally made from blood. <laughs> yeah, uh, which sounds gross. Um... Yeah, so I tried it. It's not that bad. (laughs) Okay, I'll take your word for it. Um, I'm gonna pass. My Uh, my husband was Canadian, so it was a Canadian thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. So the um, Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, those those things that they are told not to do, um, all of those are tied to uh, different forms of pagan worship Mm -hmm. and so like to avoid sexual morality that was that's part of the moral law in the old testament but it is also part of the ceremonial law because the church or the 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 structure of the priests it throughout the the old testament and throughout the laws that we've looked so far they have been clearly instructed to not have any kind of sexuality tied to their offerings and their worship in the tabernacle and so that's part of that. Like, do not have any kind of any hint of sexual morality in the tabernacle. The avoid meat from strangled animals. It's because the blood is still in the animal. And avoid uh, food that's sacrificed to idols because if you know it's been sacrificed to idols, it's like, well, why are you eating it? If you know, like, don't, just don't. Um, and uh, then abstain from blood is the other one. So all of those are part of the worship system that was happening all throughout the different. Um, tabernacle the different temples in the known world and so those are not part of the worship systems in our culture today and so if the the jerusalem council met and they were saying what are we going to do about the all those those heathens in the seattle area who are coming to faith what do they need to do um they would come up with probably they would pray about it and wrestle with it and say okay what are Uh the most important pieces how Uh can these people who are coming to faith in jesus live distinct set apart lives that would keep them from going back into worshiping false gods the way they used to. Okay. So, so like the, the I'm sorry. Ahead. So the strangling of a- animals had to do with uh, pagan worship. That's how they yeah. killed them or something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So that's all. Yeah. Cause they would just, yeah, it's gross. Like, um, but part of it is like the blood life is in the blood. And so even if it is a strangled animal that was not offered in a temple, but you know, like that butcher from that part of the meat market, like that's how he prepares the meat by strangulation. Don't eat that because the life is in the blood. Chickens, so, you know, wringing the neck. That's the kind of strangling. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. One of the weirdest things that I've ever been a part of, we went to Mexico and we built houses and in a village called Cofredia. And the, how, the different families in the church hosted different parts of our group for lunch. And uh, I'm sitting in the backyard, uh, like fenced in yard. This guy's got chickens, dogs, all kinds of different animals. Um, and then he 
picked up a chicken and he put it in a milk jug, like a plastic milk jug that was on the tree. <laughs> and then he put the chicken head down into the milk jug. And while we're just like eating soup, just slits its throat, <laughs> blood everywhere. Like, wow, that happened right here. And we ate that chicken <laughs> moments later. It was delicious. Um, but it was definitely a, uh, one of those ways where you're like, there's a lot of ways to do this. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is not like, when you think about where your food comes from, it all like changes how you consider what you consider worth eating. <laughs> and so I, yeah, it was weird. Anyway. Oh. It's so funny. Right. There's a movie. I'm thinking of a movie real fast, real fast. That mm -hmm. um, made me think of a movie where, like, the girl is like, like the the guy's like making dinner and he kills a chicken and, and she's like, he's like, where do you think chicken come from? And she's like, the freezer section. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Most uh, most of the time, <laughs> where did all this come from? <laughs> the store. Right? Well, yeah, we don't. Yeah, we don't experience that part of it. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, y'all have a good week. Next week, we will uh, start with chapter 11 of Leviticus and uh, we'll keep going. Just keep on trucking. So, all right. Bye. God bless Amen. Bye-bye.